Good morning. We worship a God who speaks. Amen. Is that not beautiful? Our reading this morning from the Holy Scriptures is Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thanks, Roger. All right. Well... Here we are. I my notes here. Um, I get self-conscious about Batman illustrations because uh, there, there are seasons where I, I use them a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm over my insecurity at this particular moment, and I'm going to use one again. Uh, there was, OK. My favorite Batman movie series uh, was the Dark Knight trilogy, the Christopher Nolan, Christian Bale movies. And the third one, The Dark Knight Rises, I feel like gets a bad rap. I feel like, you know, pe people like it well enough, but everyone kind of feels like it was kind of a downgrade from the second one, maybe even from the first one. Uh, but for me, I, there are days I think it might be the best of the three. Um, it's a weird movie. It's like, to me, it's one of those movies that I'm like, I can't believe that the studio would give someone that much money and the access to that character to make something so idiosyncratic and kind of strange. It, it's this movie, sorry, there are gonna be spoilers in this if you haven't seen it. It's been like 12 years. <laughs> so, shame on you if you haven't seen it. Um, but in this movie, you find Batman, Bruce Wayne, af well, just Bruce Wayne, he's not Batman anymore after the events of the second film where he had uh, basically taken, uh, taken the guilt on himself for the district attorney's murder, murderous rampage to try to preserve the hope of the city. But, so he can't be Batman anymore. And you find Bruce Wayne like in, this, in, in his mansion, and he's like walking with a cane, and he's like gaunt looking, and he has facial hair, which is weird. Batman never has facial hair. And uh, his hair is graying, and he's depressed. He's depressed. And uh, you find for the first like hour of this movie, Bruce Wayne is just like this decrepit shell of himself that Alfred, his butler, is afraid has this death wish. Um, he has no will to live. And in the film, so the film to me is this really actually fascinating, interesting meditation on pain and kind of the, the what, what does it take to find the will to live and the, even the desire to experience joy again. And of course, a supervillain shows up, as they are wont to do in movies like this guy by the name of Bane starts terrorizing the city and Bruce Wayne is like sweet they need me again I can be Batman again but it doesn't play like tr super triumphantly because Alfred again tells him I think you want to go out there and I think you want to die like that's the world that this movie is operating in again it's weird <laughs> but it's, it's powerful and and what happens is Batman goes out and he has a few skirmishes but when he finally faces off against the villain if you remember the scene, he gets utterly beaten and destroyed. And the villain lifts him up over his head and like breaks his back over his knee. And then he banishes him to a prison. And uh, it's not looking too good for our hero at that point. But kind of the, the emotional crux of the movie is this idea that he, he's in this pit. And the villain explains like, the pit is here basically to give you a false hope that you can climb out of it. Like there's no gate on top. It's just a thing you have to climb out of. He's like, everyone who's tried to climb out of this except one person has fallen, hurt themselves, died, whatever. The, the open pit is literally just to keep you tortured with the promise that maybe someday I could get out and to keep trying, but you'll never, you'll never win. It's very, 
It's very dark. It's very dark. And Bruce Wayne, he's Batman. If anyone should be able to climb a wall, it's him, right? Um, but he tries multiple times, and he keeps falling and hurting himself, and he, he can't do it. And uh, one of the characters tells him, the reason you can't do this is because you don't fear death. You don't fear death. You welcome death. You invite death. And it's, again, this idea that all of his striving is literally because he wants to be put out of his misery. He doesn't actually have the will to live and the power that energizes a life from actually having something to live and fight for. And so his journey in this movie is actually discovering, no, I actually do want to live a real life. Here's the real spoiler. At the end of the movie, he, of course, comes back. He has a rematch with the villain, and he wins. Um, he's, he's reconnected to that kind of vital power and life force that it takes to actually fight and succeed, which is the desire to actually want to live a healthy life. And the movie concludes with him retiring as Batman, handing over all his stuff to the next generation and whatever, donating all of his rema remaining money to the city, and then he goes, and he just like lives a life. And if you remember the last scene, Alfred sees him in a cafe in like Paris or something, sees him uh, with Selena, the, his love interest, and just nods at him. And he's like, oh, Bruce Wayne has, he's healthy now. And the thesis of this movie seems to be like, putting on a, a bat costume and going and punching criminals may not be the best way to deal with your trauma. <laughs> that, isn't that weird for a Batman movie? That's how that movie ends. Says, he got healthy. He wants to live a normal life, and he put all the Batman stuff away, and he went on to, like, presumably, like, live a life and perhaps have children and, like, live. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I, that image of, like, this person continuing and trying to do the things that he's called to do, going to fight the villains, whatever, disconnected from the essential thing that could actually give you victory, that could actually give you the power to be successful. And without that thing, it's never going to happen. It's like, it's like taking uh, this microphone, having it unplugged to the sound system, and just hoping, like, oh, this is going to work, right? Or the, the power switch is off here. Is it? No, no. There's no power switch on this one. But, like, trying to do something utterly disconnected from the very thing that would give it its power and its ability to function. That's the image. That's the image that movie has. And that's the image as we dive into the Holy Spirit more and more each week here that I want you to be stuck with. Um, the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see as in the passage that Roger just read for us, it is that vital source of power, that life giving energy that comes not just because it's energy or force in prison, from a person, from God the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, living within the people of God, empowering to do the things that he's called them to do. The image we get time and time again throughout the New Testament is disconnected from that essential power, there is nothing we can do. There is nothing we can do. So it's very important to figure out, like, how do we maintain that connection? So we're in this series throughout the summer called The Spirit and His Gifts. We're exploring what the Bible says about, yes, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, and these amazing gifts, these amazing promises that he's made to do in and through God's people. Last week we mentioned this verse briefly in John 17 where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, that's the Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And we, we raise this question, like, do you believe that? Jesus is saying that there's something about the age in which you, right now, in 2022, live that is better than what the disciples had 2,000 years ago, being with Jesus in flesh and blood. That's hard to believe. But again, what we have to do with all of these things that are hard to believe that Jesus tells us is to try to submit to them and say, I don't get it, I don't understand, I want to understand, help me in my unbelief, Lord. We hope that this series is going to help you come to understand and help me come to understand why Jesus said that and to actually believe it in your core, in your heart of hearts, that Jesus is telling the truth. And then pursuing the Spirit together... Um, <laughs> that this time is going to mark a new season of experiencing more of what the Spirit of God wants to do in and through us. That's what we're after. So last week we talked about the, the, the promises around, the, like who is the Holy Spirit, and then the promises that, that, that God had been making throughout the Old Testament for some kind of new work the Spirit was going to do. Today we're talking about an activity of the Holy Spirit called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
um, which I'm going to argue could also be called just receiving the Holy Spirit or receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not the gifts of the Spirit, which we'll talk about separately, but the, just the gift, the gift of receiving the Holy Spirit himself. And there are a few, when I say that, baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you're at all into the kind of like charismatic versus cessationist debate or you're much of a, you know, theology head, you'll probably rightfully recognize there's a lot of debate over how to understand that phrase, baptism of or with or in the Spirit. And I'm more than happy to process with any of you like why we've landed where we have at Dorf Hope on that debate. Um, but I'm just going to kind of bypass that for now and just kind of make, make the biblical case here as I see it. Um, but, but seriously, feel free to reach out. Um, our conviction is that um, this reception of the Spirit, that this is how the biblical authors describe what happens when the Spirit of God first unites himself to a disciple of Jesus when they repent, believe the gospel, and begin to follow him. But to understand it, we have to look at the day that it first became possible to be baptized in the Spirit, the day that these amazing promises of God were fulfilled, which was the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So let's pray, and then we're going to look at Acts. Father, we want you. We want you. And Father, as we wade into uh, the doctrines around your Spirit, Father, we pray that you'd lead us into truth not inventions of our own, but that we could just submit to what you have promised, Lord. And I'm just blown away this week by, by what you have said is already, has already happened in and amongst us who have called on the name of Jesus. Lord, that we could, we could appreciate, Lord, th this vital connection that we already do have. And yes, we want more, and the remaining weeks are going to be talking about that pursuit of more. But Father, may we first just be bold over with what you have already given us. That we would not ignore it, that we would recognize it, that we would lean into it, Father, that we would operate in a crucial connection to it. Help us this morning, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as, as we mentioned last week, the Old Testament prophets, you read through the Old Testament, you get to the prophets towards the end there. They began to speak of this coming day when the Messiah was going to come, He's going to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out and put within God's people in a new way. We said, in the Old Testament, you see the Spirit come on people for particular times, particular purposes, and then he'll leave. Uh, it's typically reserved to, like, key leaders and prophets. It's just kind of a limited kind of, um, yeah, controlled experience. But the prophet said, something new is coming. Something new is coming where the Spirit's going to be poured out on all of God's people. And as, as the prophets are writing, God's people, they've been stuck in exile outside their land, and then later they're back in their land, but they're still under the oppressive thumb of these oppressive empires, finally in Rome, under Rome at the time of the New Testament. And they're just unable to live out the faithfulness to the covenant that they've desired. They're, they're unable to follow God as they might desire in their heart of hearts. And they just began to, to, to increasingly long for this day and the blessings that are going to come. Whatever is going to happen with the Spirit, we need it. We need it now. We can't wait for this. And so the Spirit, the God is, the Spirit of God is moving the prophets to speak about these things and to write them down, and, and the expectation is building. So into that longing, near the beginning of the four Gospels, there began to be this new, more specific prophecy from John the Baptist. Uh, all, I think all four of the Gospels have it, but I'll read from Mark 1.8. John the Baptist declared, I have baptized you with water. Remember, he's out there baptizing in the Jordan. He says, but he, this is the Messiah who's coming after John, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And water baptism is important. It's still important. It is still important. But he is going to baptize you with something even more significant, with the Holy Spirit. So, so John is declaring, hey, the day is, is coming. And then he baptizes Jesus, and this whole thing kickstarts. And yes, Jesus talked in several places about how he's going to send his spirit to his followers, but the promise came to a head after he had gone to the cross, raised from the dead, and appeared to the disciples just before ascending to heaven. So I'm going to read what Roger read for us again. So, promise is building, John the Baptist declare it, Messiah is going to do this, now Jesus. These are Jesus' parting words to his disciples, and this, it's always important. I don't know if you've ever, like, been with someone near death. I assume many of you have. 
parting words are crucial. There is a weight to, the, to this moment of like, this is the last thing I have to say to you. And we, we know Jesus wasn't dying when he ascended. He is alive. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But nonetheless, this was his last time to be in the flesh with his disciples until his return. So, so when you hear the kind of final words of Jesus, you lean in close. And you go, okay, this must be really important. So it is. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, there it is again, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on, and he was lifted up, and the clouds took him out of their sight. He ascended to the right hand of God. So Jesus' last words were, hey, I'm going to have you be my witnesses. The, the, what you need to do is take this good news to the ends of the earth. It starts here, but it goes increasingly out to everywhere. He says, don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. That's kind of weird. Like, oh, yeah, Jesus, you raised from the dead. You are Messiah. You are God in human flesh. We've got to tell the world. And you know what? You're gracious and loving and good and beautiful and true. We've got to take this message out. And Jesus said, yes, but not yet. Why? Why not yet? Why sit tight? It's right there. He says, wait, wait for the promise of the Father. You will receive, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you go. Wait for this power. Do not try to do it on your own authority. Do not try to muster up the strength. Don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps because it's not going to work. You need supernatural power that you do not have within yourself. Sit tight. This baptism in the Spirit is what was going to bring and enable them to share the good news of Jesus everywhere. These are the parting words of Jesus before his ascension, so we listen closely to them. So that's the promise. The promise is continuing to build from the Old Testament into the, through the Gospels, and now at the very beginning of Acts, the promise is building, and then the promise gets fulfilled. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13. I'll just read this, read this all. When the day of Pentecost arrived... That's a feast 50 days after the Passover. They were all together in one place. Suddenly there came, listen to this, just sing about this. From heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house which they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, that's other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? It's like, aren't these those backwoods guys? And how is it that we are hearing each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. Everybody hears in their own language. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, fair enough, saying to one another, what does this mean? And then others were mocking. Others mocking said they are filled with new wine. <laughs> I've seen this kind of craziness before. Two crucial things to understand about Pentecost. And if you forget either of them, I think you'll slip into error. Here's the first. This was, this was a, perhaps the, unique turning point in salvation history. And there was only one Pentecost, okay? 
the promises that the people of God had been waiting for for generations and generations and generations for the Spirit to be poured out. Those prophecies we looked at last week, the longing, it came on this day. This was the time. This was the turning point of the ages, from the previous ages, whatever you want to call them, to the age of the Spirit. From the age of various things to the age of the church. From the prior days to what, even if we were to read on in Acts, uh, what they call, quoting the prophet Joel, the last days. Do you know you live in the last days? You've been living in the last days for 2,000 years almost. This was the turning point. Salvation, I mean, history shifted. That was the peak. We're on the other side of something now from the day of Pentecost. The dramatic events of this day were to fulfill prophecy and demonstrate that it had truly happened. Peter makes that clear if we were to read on in his sermon. He says, this is that day that Joel, the prophet, talked about when the Spirit's going to be poured out on all of God's people and they're all going to prophesy and do these amazing things. Here it is, right here. So get... Hope you believe that. The second thing, though, is this. That it was a turning point. It was not just a day, like a flash in the pan, and then it's like, okay, well, that was great. Now everything's sort of back to normal. The the point has truly turned. We really do live in the age of the Spirit of God. God has come to his people in a new way that had never happened before. And it will mark the rest of human history, at least until Jesus returns. These are both important because if you forget the first, that Pentecost was a unique, like like one of the unique days in history, then you are going to be looking for experiences that Jesus never promised you. If you're looking for tongues of fire to appear on our heads, we never see another example of that ever again in, in the New Testament. We never hear about the, the, the wind rushing that way. We never see quite a dramatic uh, display as we saw on that day. And if you think that every day is meant to look like that, you're just going to be searching in vain for something that Jesus never promised. And you'll, here's what's even more scary, you'll be tempted to fabricate them. You'll be tempted to fabricate these things when you don't experience them. But if you forget the second point, you will likely live a Christian life without any power. You will likely live a Christian life without pursuing and experiencing the genuinely amazing blessing and power that we are meant to walk in with the fact that the baptism in the Spirit is available to you. The Spirit does all these amazing things. So we've got to keep both of those held together at the same time. This was a unique day, but it started a new day, a new era that we are living in right now. It hasn't, that era has not ended So that's the promise. I want to take a minute to just define, though, the baptism of the Spirit. That's an, that's an interesting phrase. First of all, you just need to know the word, the word baptism, the Greek word baptizo, carries the essential meaning of being submerged or dipped. That's why we're a, we're, we're a church that practices in water baptism, submersion. It's kind of baked into the word itself. Um, so to, to be baptized is to be submerged into some element. And the idea behind this language is this. Okay, baptized in the Holy Spirit. What is that? It means to be fully submerged in the presence of God himself. That the Spirit actually, the idea is that the Spirit is actually able to penetrate your whole person fully. It implies the Spirit is upon you and within you. Like there's no inch of you that the Spirit has not penetrated. What we're going to argue is that this ba- the spirit baptism is a once-for-all-time gift of God that happens to you when you trust Jesus. But what is it? Okay, that's kind of the concept, but what actually happens? I just want to briefly give you five of the major things that happened when the spirit baptism came upon New Testament, be- Testament believers, and we're going to move through these quickly. But just to put some flesh on this. So they're talking about the Spirit. We see the amazing things at Pentecost. But what else happens when the Spirit first comes upon his people? Well, first, we see that they became, the New Testament believers became the permanent home of the Spirit. The permanent home of the Spirit. There is a new 
presence within these believers. Jesus, Jesus was looking forward to this day when he said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home within him. Make a home within him. The idea is that the father and the son make their home within someone via the presence of the spirit of God. God comes to live and to never leave than the people of God. This is the same idea that's in the temple of God imagery I'm sure you've read in 1 Corinthians. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has made his home in, in his new temples, which is you. And often it's talked about the church together, us here, all, however many of us in this room are believers in Jesus. We, when we together, we, when we are gathered together, we are uniquely the temple, temples and singular temple of God. The presence of God. So there's union with Christ and the Father through the Spirit that can never be taken away. Never to be taken away. The second thing we see is that the, the New Testament believers were born again through the Spirit. And that phrase sometimes gets, gets looked on with suspicion for some reason, you know, born-again Christians or whatever, but it's an essential part of what it means to become, become a believer. There's a new birth. The baptism and reception of the Spirit is associated with this idea. Theologians call it regeneration, where you pass from spiritual death to spiritual life, from being born again through the same work of the Spirit. Listen to jo Jesus in John 3, his conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus. Truly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus acknowledges there is mystery here, but there is an essentialness to the fact that anyone who, who is going to be part of God's kingdom must be born again, and that born again comes through the Spirit of God. A new birth and a new heart. Third thing, third thing that we see is that these believers were given a place in the church or family of God by the Spirit. They get a new identity in this new family. 1 Corinthians 12, says, uh, verses 12 and 13, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slave or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. So again, Paul is saying one, the, the baptism of the spirit is not something that some believers have and others don't. It's one of the common ground things that unites all of God's people. And it's what brings them entrance into the church, into this family that God is creating from people of every tribe, tongue, and nation across time, across the globe. The spirit is what brings you into that family. Number four. Number four, the New Testament believers received influence from the Spirit. It's not just like, okay, these things have happened, and now I'm just going to keep doing my thing. The Spirit is an active presence, moving and shaping and pushing the people that he dwells within. One example of this is in Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There's that family thing again. But listen to this, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Listen to this. And the spirit himself bears witness with or to our spirit that we are children of God. The spirit bears witness to you. He confirms your sonship and your daughtership to the king. To the Father. Gives you confidence. He's, he's bearing witness to you. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
That's just one example. The Spirit confirms your, your sonship. He, he, he helps you. It talks about the Spirit of God pouring the love of God into your heart. Maybe some, maybe some of you experienced that before. Just this overwhelming sense of the love of God. That's how the New Testament talks about the Spirit of God coming upon people, pouring the love of God into your heart. The New Testament talks about the Spirit teaching, shaping, bearing witness. It talks about giving spiritual discernment to those that he's within. So he brings a new influence. And part of our role and what, something we're going to talk about is how do we actually yield to that influence? And then one last thing. I want to mention now. There are other things we could say, but these are the big ones in my opinion. They were empowered by the Spirit. They were given a new power. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 says, Now there are various gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And we're going to spend several weeks unpacking the nature of the, the gifts of the Spirit. How does that all work? What should we expect? How do you determine, like, how are you gifted? We'll get there. What this says right now is that when the Spirit of God, if you're a believer, came upon you, He gifted you. He gave you power to do things for the building up, the strengthening of this church. To each, everyone, without distinction is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the New Testament believers were empowered by that Spirit. Okay. I think that might be the last kind of like Bible blitz we do in this, uh, in this series. I know those aren't the most satisfying things to listen to, just dot, 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 but there you go. There you go. Those are the key results of this baptism of the Spirit, I would argue. Let's jump back to Acts. Acts chapter 2. So, the Spirit shows up, tongues of fire, rushing wind. The, these Galileans start speaking all of these languages from all over the known world. And people are hearing them. People are actually, the images, people are speaking, and the people are supernaturally hearing these languages in their own, they're hearing what's spoken in their own languages. It's, it's, a, it's a clear miracle. It's not just like, wow, these guys are really well studied. Three people standing there who only speak different languages are hearing one voice in their, translated supernaturally by the Spirit of God. It's a reversal of the Tower of Babel. It's a key moment in history. Some people are amazed, some people are confused, some people are mocking this, saying these guys are just drunk. This is weird. But then Peter stands up and he lends crucial context. Because if you just saw this, you'd be like, well, that's weird. But Peter stands up and he begins to preach. And he said, this is the day the prophet Joel talked about when the Spirit of God's going to be poured out. And all of this, he, he connects it to, this is all because of Jesus. This is all because of Jesus. Because Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one through whom this has all come. The very Jesus that was just crucified. He's alive now. And he's responsible for this. And this is the proof that Jesus was who he says he was. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. We should read it. We just don't have time right now. But after that, after that, here's the end of the sermon. Verse 36, chapter 2. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's what all this is pointing to. Now here's their reaction. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, turn, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe he's talking about this same baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, as Peter continued to preach, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to they were added that day about three thousand souls. The birth of the church. How the Christian church got started in history by this miraculous act of the Holy Spirit. Peter getting up and preaching in the power of the Spirit, contextualizing this moment, telling them to repent, be baptized. Three thousand people are added to the church. What I want to highlight right now is this, verse 39. Jesus says, the promise is for you who are here, who are here on the day of Pentecost, listening, seeing these amazing things, for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off. This promise, these amazing promises of the gospel, Jesus highlights two really important ones. You know, the the death and resurrection of Jesus accomplished many things, but two of the most important are this. One, the forgiveness of sins. We talk about that all the time. What's he put right next to it? Your belief, repent. Listen, repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. And be baptized. That's express your faith publicly through water baptism. Repent and believe. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. For the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the forgiveness of your sins, righteousness before God. Praise God for that. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You too will receive this Spirit within you. And it's not just for those people standing there 2,000 years ago. It is for you, Door of Hope Northeast. That gift of the Spirit did not cease that day. Again, we are in the age. We are in the other side of the Spirit's coming. It is for you. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus, if you are one of those who has has received that call to follow him, this is yours. The baptism of the Spirit, the reception of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, however you want to term it, this is part of your vital connection to Jesus. Jesus sends the Spirit of God to make his home within you, and that same Spirit then points you back to Jesus. That's how this works. It forms us into Jesus' image. So here's the point of all this. What I want you to really walk away from is that this is not just a history lesson about a cool thing that God did for those people then. The baptism of the Spirit is for you. And not just that, if you have trusted Jesus, if, you're con- if the confession of your mouth and your heart is that Jesus is Lord, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was something that happened to you and for you the moment you trusted in Jesus. So if you're in Christ, I want you to hear this. If you feel like you're the kind of second class Christian, or like the Spirit hasn't wanted anything to do with you. Or that He's not in you in the way that He is in other people. I submit, Peter would say to you, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, you're wrong. Praise God you're wrong. The Spirit is within you. He has made His home within you. He does want to influence you. He has empowered you. He is at work in you. If you're not a follower of Jesus and you want these things, I just say to you, place your faith in Jesus today and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All these promises become yours. I think our first step as a community, as we're trying to to, to lean into all the things that the Spirit of God has for us is this. The first step is just recognizing recognizing what God has already given you in his spirit. Recognizing it, thanking God for it, appreciating it, and stepping out with confidence into it. We're going to be talking over the coming weeks about asking for more, being filled with the spirit, learning to... to walk in the power of the gifts of the Spirit and so on. All those things are coming. But I just say right now, today, this week, here's where we start. 
The Spirit of God has made his home in you. He's not scandalized by you if you're in Christ. He has made his home in you, and he will never leave you. He will never leave you. And yes, when we sin, we can grieve him. We can shut the door to his influence. We can try to tamp him down. We can walk totally out of step with him. We're going to talk about that too. But he never leaves you. He never leaves you. He's always there within you. Later on, just a few minutes actually, we're going to sing, sing the song Holy Spirit. Um, we've sung it here before. I love the way the lyrics on the bridge state this. They, they say this, let us become a, more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. What that's declaring to us is that the Spirit of God is here with us. He is within you. We don't have to say, God, you know, you're out there somewhere. Please come here. Like, come on. He's here. That's what all this is getting at. The spirit, we live in the age where the, if you are in Christ, the Spirit of God has made his home. There's nothing, there's no magical incantation to do. He is in you. So let us, God, the prayer is, let us become aware let us see it. Give us the eyes to see what you are already here doing more and more and more. Let us experience your presence amongst us in a new way. Amen? That's what we're after. So if you're comfortable, or even if you're uncomfortable but willing, I want you to stand with me. We're going to pray together. said there's more to talk about plenty more to talk about in the coming weeks but we start here stand with me and close your eyes and there, here's where we'll get real funky I want you to get in a posture of thanksgiving whatever I, whatever that means for you if it's standing there straight and still that is fine I'm the only one that can see you right now You need to bow if you want to raise your hands, if you want to open palm, posture of reset, whatever it is. Your body in a posture of thanksgiving. And I want you to pray after me, phrase by phrase, this prayer of acknowledgement and thanksgiving. Repeat after me. Father, thank you for sending your son to save me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for making your home within me. Thank you for all the blessings that come with this. Forgive me for forgetting or failing to recognize them. Help me become more aware of your presence within me. Spirit, let me experience this truth today. I want all of you that you will give me. Amen.